Frank Seppi here with Robert Wilkins for Fit to Serve. We are back. And Rob, why don't you introduce our guest today? Hello, Frank. Good seeing you again. I'm glad to be back after our, our little hiatus there. You got a great background. Congratulations on your new house and everything. So um, we're in the wilderness. Looking well for you. <laughs> it's looking good. But it's my honor and pleasure today to be with a fellow Air Force veteran, a friend, um, a woman of many talents, uh, Therese Garner. We're uh, pleased to have you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and actually rearranging your schedule to spend time with us today. So um, welcome to our podcast. Appreciate absolutely, it. absolutely. And also I want to make sure it's known, it's Garnier, because it's got a little finesse. Garnier. Garnier, like the right. shampoo, except like I'm not shampoo, making the shampoo right? money. <laughs> except I'm not making the shampoo money, but you know, that'll come. <laughs> it's the green bottle, Rob. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you so well, much. How about if you, thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, where you're from, um, Milter. basically where you're from. And, and if you come from, you know, what your family did in the past to get you to the point to where you're at now, and what you're doing. So just act like we don't know anything about you and fill us in, please. Okay, perfect. No problem. So I was born in Bluefield, West Virginia. And but I was only there until I was five years old. And then I moved around a lot as a kid. But I claim Michigan because that's where I lived the longest. So I was a military brat. Um, and my dad was in the Marines. He actually flew President uh, Obama around. So that was a pretty, pretty cool experience. I didn't get to meet the president. I'm still holding that against him because of that. But <laughs> we're not going to go there. But um, so I was right. a military brat and grew up mostly in Michigan, moved around a lot. Uh, moved to Louisiana, Hurricane Katrina hit, ended up being displaced because of Hurricane Katrina, ended up in California, uh, where I graduated. And then I went to art college in Memphis, Tennessee, I had a full ride scholarship. And I only went there for a year. And then I left the school because I said, you know, my passion was art, but I didn't want to be a broke artist my entire life and then basically die and get rich after I'm dead. That kind of defeats the whole purpose. So I said, you know what, maybe I'm going to look uh, at some other options. And so at that point, I moved to Japan where I went to school full time and I was working on uh, Iwakuni as a um, public Actually, at that time, I was a photographer and then I was also interning at a local TV station. I fell in love with it. I said, this is my calling. You know, I want to help people. I want to be a reporter. So I started doing some mm -hmm. research. And then I realized that the Air Force has an amazing broadcast program. So I said, let you, you know, let me sign up for that. And I signed up and got sent to basic and got sent right back to Japan as a broadcast journalist. So I spent the mm -hmm. next three years there uh, anchoring the Pacific Report. I also worked at AF in Tokyo, where I would shoot... Um, different news stories, you know, depending on the day. And I also had a full uh, radio show, one man band radio show. Mm -hmm. um, it was Eagle 810. I was DJ Fructis. So I woke up everyone first thing in the morning at 6 a.m. and uh, got their day going. And uh, it was just an amazing, phenomenal experience. And so once I left Japan, I got to Joint Base Andrews and I got to do a lot of POTUS missions. I did public affairs. So I got to see- For those who don't know, what does POTUS mean? Oh, I'm sorry. So that would be the president of the United States. So uh, on Joint Base Andrews, that's where the president lands um, or takes off whenever they're going on any trips. That's where Air Force One is. And so my job was to escort the media onto base so they can get the video of them landing and taking off. And so that was a great experience. Uh, I did that for a year, no, almost two years. And then I got out of the military during that time, I started interning at CBS, uh, the DC Bureau. And then from there, I ended up getting hired with Fox News Channel, where I worked with them for a few months. And then when I took that contract on, I told them, look, I'm applying to go to Syracuse to get my master's. So if this position that you guys are talking about doesn't open up, I'm going to go get my master's. And it never opened up. So I said, OK, you know, after a few months, I said, OK, time for me to go. So I went to Syracuse, got my master's then got hired back by Fox News, uh, went to New York, did the interviews, and they sent me to South Carolina where I covered the entire uh, Southeast region. So I was in Louisiana, Alabama, um, New York, Illinois. I, they had me everywhere covering different stories for two years. And then once that finished, I went to Florida. I did local news for a bit. And then I came to DC where I did, um, I was a Pentagon correspondent for Newsy, now known as Crips News. So that was an amazing uh, experience. And now 
Uh, I left uh, Newsy in 2022, May of 2022. And since then, you know, I took this last year and a half to one, focus on family. Uh, during the pandemic, I realized that family's so important. You know, the news will always be there, but family might not be. And I lost a lot of loved ones during the pandemic. So I said, you know what? I need to take a step back, recalibrate and refocus on what's important. That was family. So I've spent the last year and a half spending time with family and doing what I love to do, which is volunteering. So uh, mm -hmm. become huge into volunteering, raised thousands of dollars for homeless veteran women and their children. I got involved in pageants, mm -hmm. which is now how I'm Miss International World United States. So I'm using my platform to also raise awareness about homeless veteran women and their children. And also, um, you know, I'm an advocate for educating people on sexual assault among children as well as adults, what their um, services that are offered for them, if they want to report it, how they should, uh, things of that nature. So it's been a it's been an amazing journey from when I was a little kid in Bluefield, when I was a little kid in Bluefield, West Virginia, <laughs> to where I am now. And yes, I did actually talk like that. Um, I did a lot of training to get rid of that accent, but you know, it's been an amazing journey so far. Mm -hmm. That's it. Frank? That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know you, you just touched on it. Uh, we'll talk about your book that you have coming yes. up. So I'm super excited. My book is called No Longer Silent. And basically it goes into, I don't want to go into a lot of the details because I want people to check out the book. But basically, um, as a kid, I, I was raped as a child. And then again, when I served in the military. And so basically the book is discussing those traumas and how I was able to overcome them. And my hope is that when people read that, if they've experienced that, they can see that, wow, like she went through that. How did she, how was she able to get through that and know that you can heal from it? You'll never forget it, but there is a way mm -hmm. to own it. You know, don't let that situation define who you are as a person, you know, take your power back. And so the book goes into those situations that I was able to overcome and what I'm doing now to help other people who may have been assaulted either as a child or as an adult. And so the book is coming out on Veterans Day because that's the 10 year anniversary of when I was assaulted in the military. Mm -hmm. So it's also, uh, I think, a great way to kind of look at Veterans Day a, in a different light. You know, most people think of it as, oh, veterans are so happy. They serve. They're celebrating that service. Uh, but for me on that day, it was not a it was never really a good day for me because I would you know, be triggered by what happened to me on that day. So with me releasing this book on Veterans Day, now I have something positive that I can say, look, I released this book. I took all my pain, put it into this book to help other people. And if I can help other people, that's going to make my Veterans Day better now because now I know that at least I'll be helping others in the process. So I'm really excited. Um, my first time writing a book, so first time author. So mm -hmm. I'm really hoping that it'll help a lot of people, especially, you know, it's astronomical how many people, one, have been assaulted in the military and two, children. I mean, we hear stories mm -hmm. all the time of kids going to churches and being assaulted at churches and being at home and being assaulted by family members. And I think that it's important to not sweep it under the rug and also to talk to your kids. If you see them acting differently, you know, explain to them what's acceptable as far as like hugging and things of that nature, what isn't. If you do experience those things, you need to tell me as a parent. Um, I'm not a parent, I'm a dog mom, but if a person is a parent and this happens to their child, how to speak to them, what questions to ask them. And so I'm hoping that it'll help a lot of people um, especially when they see my journey going from broadcaster to a homeless veteran to a sexual assault survivor to now an author. I want them to know that no matter what life throws at you, you can overcome it and you can be successful. It's just all in your mindset. It's all about, you know, being mindful, setting boundaries. You know, if they don't believe in meditation, that's fine. They don't have to, but just taking time and setting it aside for yourself to set those boundaries, uh, reassess yourself in your life, what you can do to be better in your own life and what you can do to help others be better in their lives as well. So I'm really super excited. So I hope you guys will get a chance to read it, but it's that's gonna be on Veterans Day of this what's year. The, what's the title of the book? So it's called No Longer Silent. Um, and hence, you know, for me, I'm not being quiet about what happened to me anymore. I feel like when I was a kid, a lot of the things that I told people that was happening, they didn't believe me. And I even had adult, the, the adult that assaulted me said, you can tell whoever you want, no one's ever going to believe you. And they did. 
literally what he said was true. So for me, I'm like, I'm no longer going to be silent about this because the longer we stay silent about topics such as this, people don't realize how rampant it is and changes can't be made. So we have to start having these conversations and people need to feel comfortable in sharing their stories. And that's the first step in my opinion. And when you were going through these unfortunate situations, did you find some support? Was there a resource that you were able to? Was the military supportive? Were they helpful? Um, and I guess on the opposite side, as you said, once you went public, did you find some people um, started to shy away or ostracize you for reporting what happened? So I would say when I first reported it, for one, I was an anchor in Japan. So I was known all throughout Japan, all of Asia, all of Europe. Mm. So everyone knew me. I mean, it was to the point, and I say this jokingly, it was to the point where I would wear like wigs and stuff when I would go out you know, wear disguises because people will recognize me everywhere I went. Right. And so I'm like, I just want to go out to Tokyo and just have some fun and not be recognized by people. And so when I was assaulted, it was terrifying for me because I'm like, this is going to get out and people are going to know me and they're no longer going to see Therese as, uh, oh, the girl who stands at the crosswalk and helps the elementary school kids get to school, you know, safely. Or, oh, look, Therese who raised money for vaccines for children in Africa and Asia. They're no longer going to see that Therese. They're going to see the victim or they're going to see the person who made it up, which is actually what ended up happening uh, because the person that assaulted me was very popular on the base, he had tons of medals real charismatic, everyone loved him. Everyone assumed I was making it up. And instantly I became public enemy number one. And it was baffling how, like I said, I spent a whole year and a half being super involved in the community, raising you know awareness for different things. And then how quickly people turned when something like that happened. And it was, I was very isolated and, and frankly ostracized. Um, if it weren't for my attorney, I don't know if I would have survived the whole or ordeal because literally during that time, he was the only one that believed me and supported me and backed me um, throughout, throughout the whole situation. I later found a few other people who supported me as well. But when it comes to the military and something like that happens, people want to get as far away from that as possible. They don't want to have any association with it. And so even if there were people who believed me, they would never voice it. And, you know, they wouldn't want to be around me because you know, I was a pariah at that point, you know, and so thankfully I had my attorney and I had what's called the gym and it was absolutely amazing. So I got, I kicked it into high gear and started working out a lot. I was doing five days a week working out two of those days. I would, two of those days I would do two a days. So I would go in in the morning and then after I got off work, go work out again. And I had a trainer and for me, that was such a great way to let out a lot of that stress and anxiety I was feeling from the whole situation. And then that's also what led me into snowboarding. So, you know, I've been able to use Wait, fitness. Snowboarding where? In Japan? Were you snowboarding yes. from Japan? <laughs> yes, for oh, my wow. first time. It was uh -huh. great. Never snowboard. Have you guys ever snowboarded? Yeah. Okay, so you have. Have you, Rob? No, I have not. No, okay, fail. Okay, <laughs> I'm not going to count that against you, though. I'm not good, but I <laughs> but you tried it. But you tried it. I'll give you that. Well, when I was in Japan, I had a friend say, hey, come out to this party with a bunch of snowboarders and we're just going to talk about snowboarding. And I'm like, OK, I guess I'll check it out. I was a skateboarder in, in middle school, so I used to skateboard. So I said, sure, I'll check it out. I went there and I'm like, oh, this looks so cool. And I was instantly hooked. So my first trip I ever went on, I decided to go snowboarding. It was through uh, MWR. They had a trip going. I can't remember where it was, but we had a trip going out and uh, I get to the to the mountain and the few service members that were there, they kind of were, they knew who I was. And so they were kind of being, they wouldn't talk to me and they, they like, was like, don't come near us, like go away. They were being real nasty, making remarks about my assault and all that stuff. And, you know, when I fell, they would point and laugh at me and they were just horrible. But anyways, so I'm, you know, for me, I'm like, I'm going to make the best of this situation. So at that time I was pretty fluent in Japanese. So I went over to, you know, some of the people there and I said, you know, hey, can I come snowboard with you? I don't want to do this by myself. And they're like, yeah, of course, come on up. So I get on this lift and I'm going up to the top of the mountain with them. And then we we get off the lift and then they go, all right, bye. See you at the bottom. And they took me up on the top <laughs> of a black diamond. Ooh. And I'm this was my first time snowboarding <laughs> ever. And I thought I made that pretty clear. It was my first time, but maybe I didn't. Maybe there's a little, you know, <laughs> translation problem there. So I'm like, 
All right. So this is this is what's about to happen. It took me three hours to get down that mountain. No <laughs> joke. By the third hour, I was like, you know what? Skip this. I'm done with this. I took the board off. I sat on it and rode, <laughs> like slid down it. But what's so funny is after that, I was like, as sucky as that was having to go down a black diamond, it was so fun. The the views were beautiful. Being out there in the mountains, you know, uh, you really don't feel cold because you're moving. And it's such a great workout. When I say that night, I went to sleep the next day. I woke up, I felt like I was hit by a bus. I really felt like I had been hit by a bus because you literally, you're working out your arms, your back, your core, your legs, because you're balancing. And I never realized that. So the next day I woke up feeling like I got hit by a bus. And then two days later, I'm like, I want to do it again. <laughs> and after that, every weekend I was going snowboarding and it was great. It got to the point where I was doing jumps and I was going off ramps and all this stuff. And so- that's kind of the funny story of how I got into to snowboarding and how my first experience was on a black diamond of all things. So, you know, fitness can be helpful. <laughs> so, so many people that we've come across uh, talk about how fitness mentally helped them. Now you were talking about, um, you know, obviously the things that you went through, fitness was a big component in mental health. Just talk about that. And, and I know you were doing two days. We'll, Talk about your workouts and how it mentally helped you. Well, I think for one, I've always been into fitness my whole life. Like my dad was a Marine, so that's what he did for fun. He tried <laughs> to use that as punishment for me and it didn't work because I enjoyed it too much. And then in basic <laughs> training, they tried to use that to punish me and it didn't work because I enjoyed <laughs> it too much. So I've always been into fitness, but I think, uh, you know, during that time, it was definitely instrumental, um, you know, being able to get out and it's one thing you can control. Like I couldn't control what everyone else was doing around me. I couldn't control how people felt about me or what they thought about me. But what I could control is what I'm doing to improve myself, what I'm doing to help myself. And so for me, you know, I had a trainer and he was phenomenal. I love him. He's, he's great. I'm still in touch with him. That was back in 2012. We're still friends. Um, you know, being able to train with him and be safe because that was one of the, always one of my concerns. Like I can do all these different types of trainings, but when do I know when to stop? You know, I don't want to overexert myself and then end up having these injuries because I didn't realize like, okay, Therese, that was a sign that you should probably like take a break today or not work out today or do a different workout. So it was great training with a trainer. Also, he had lots of advice on eating habits. Now, granted during that time, I was a very healthy eater, but he introduced me to intermittent fasting. And I remember when he first brought it up, he was like, oh man, you got to try this intermittent fasting. I've been doing it for years and you, you'll think it's great. And I'm sitting here like, I said, dude, you're a lunatic. I'm not doing that. You're starving yourself all day. Why would you do that? That makes, that sounds counterintuitive. You're working out all day and then starving yourself. That's what I thought of it. He was like, look, listen to me, Therese, hear me out. Just try it for a week. If you don't like it, at least you can say you tried it. I said, okay, cool. I'll try it. Tried it for a week. That was back in 2012. I've been doing it since. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, one changing that and you're not really starving yourself. That was just my perception of it. But um, once I started doing intermittent fasting, I felt more energetic. Uh, I wanted to do more workouts. Uh, I just had so much more energy to do things that I didn't have before. And I feel so much healthier. And so I'm so glad he introduced me to that. But it's not just about the workouts. It's also about your eating habits as well. So those two things were definitely instrumental in getting me through that whole situation because I was dealing with a lot of mental, you know, anxieties from, you know, the whole situation. So at least those were aspects I can control how I worked out, when I worked out, what I ate, what I did to better myself physically. And then the mental help came along the way as, you know, later on along the way as well. So I'm a big advocate for counseling. I tell everyone, I don't care if you don't think you have anything going on, go to a counselor because they can give you phenomenal advice. One, they're also two, they're paid to listen to you. So whether they want to listen to you or not, they have to, right? You have friends where sometimes you want to call them up and they're like, I'm busy. I really don't feel like talking to you today. Well, guess what? A counselor can't really do that. So, <laughs> so that's a perk of it. And then also they're going to give you really good advice versus if you go to a friend, they don't know what they're talking about. They didn't get a degree in this stuff. You know, I mean, they can give you advice from life experiences, but I just think it's always better to go to a professional who studied it, you know, um, to get good, actual, really good advice. So I started going to counseling during that time, eating well, you know, working out. And a lot of those things is what got me through, through a lot of the, the different traumas I've experienced since then. 
And so when you mentioned earlier about um, participating in pageants, how has your physical fitness and this participation in pageants and also having this platform to talk about some of your past experiences helped you get to where you're a title holder and hopefully become Miss International World, not just Miss International United States? Yes, um, it's a great question. So basically how it started, I had injured my back um, on an assignment uh, to uh, back in 2021. And during that time, you know, it was during the pandemic and we weren't really allowed to leave our homes. And so I couldn't really work out much. I mean, I'm not kidding you. I would walk up, I live in a townhouse. I'd walk up my flight of stairs and get to the top and be like, okay, hold on a second. Oh, I'm really not this out of shape. I swear to God, you know, but I'm like, this is a little embarrassing that I'm walking up a flight of stairs and I'm getting out of breath. So, you know, I'm dealing with a back injury. I'm not working out. And so I said, let me find a way that I can, get my cardio up and not, you know, get out of breath from doing simple things. And so that's when I discovered, see, the Bowflex Velicor. (laughs) Um, Love it. Um, So basically I started doing research and I said, you know, it would be great maybe if I could get an indoor bike. And I started cycling. And so fell in love with it. I was really concerned that I was going to spend all this money on this bike and only use it for a month. And then it would just be you know, sitting in the room collecting dust, but I actually ended up riding. I think so far since I got it back in March of 2021, I believe I've ridden almost 6,000 miles on my bike. Um, So usually I ride 20 miles a day, five days a week. And um, through that, I started doing, um, I started researching pageants that I could be a part of. Uh, and I found one that was called um, Miss Veteran America. And I said, wow, this is great. They Their platform was supporting or um, raising awareness for homeless veteran women and their children. And what people didn't know was I was a homeless veteran as a network news correspondent. I'm gonna let that sit for a second. Network news correspondent living out of her car. So most people didn't know that. So I said, wow, you know, I wanted to to help homeless veteran women. This is a perfect opportunity and also to share my story because when people see me, they don't think of a homeless person. So I got into the, into nope. that. Okay. See, when you say that, when you say they see you, they don't think of a homeless person. Why is that? Why do you think when they see you that they don't think of you as a homeless person? Well, you know, the, the, there's a common perception that when you see a homeless person, it's the person on the street, on the corner with, you know, ripped clothes that are soiled and they're, you know, missing teeth and they're begging for money and, you know, or talking to things that aren't there. And so that's when you say homeless, that's what people think of. However, I know so many women who literally look just like me, who work a full time job and live in their cars. It's called couch surfing. And I know Congress is trying to pass some legislation to change the definition of what homelessness is. And so a lot of people don't think of that. If you don't have a place that you call your home that is yours, you're homeless. And so I lived out of my car, a park right outside of a park. And I lived out of my car. And then I lived in a hotel for a couple, I think for a week or so. And then I had a friend be kind enough to help me move into his 360 square foot studio apartment with a dog. Mind you, he hates dogs. And he let me stay with him for a month until I was able to get on my feet. But, you know, being able to show that, you know, looks can be deceiving, you know, don't always judge a book by its cover because I may look like this, but you don't know what I'm going home to. You don't know what I'm dealing with behind the scenes. And mm-hmm. so to be able to take that stance during the pageant and kind of show like, look, this is a real issue. It was, it was great for me. And so how it, how my fitness ties into that, I started cycling to raise awareness about homelessness. It got picked up by a couple of um, networks. They did an interview on it and, you know, people started reaching out like, wow, I didn't realize this was an issue. And so thankfully it was able to garner some attention. At another point, I ended up doing these funny videos where at, uh, I was mimicking family guy. So I was on the tread uh, on my um, bike and I was reenacting one of the scenes from Family Guy where Lois had got her own um, indoor bike. And basically the day I posted that video, the next morning I woke up to messages from Bowflex saying, hey, can you do some commercials for us? And I'm like, of course, you know? And so I ended up being able to do a couple commercials for Bowflex. One of them starred my dog, which I'm so proud of. I love my little Shiba and you, my little Crixis. Um, And so from there, you know, now I'm like, yes, I'm getting healthy. I'm getting fit. Even though I'm dealing with a back injury, I'm being able to raise awareness for homelessness. 
And it just kind of slowly grew from there. So now I have a trainer. I meet with him once a week. I still go to physical therapy. So I'm going to physical therapy twice a week and then I'm still cycling. And then I meet with a trainer once a week, but it's, it's great because he's kind of helping me do a lot of body weight type workouts until I'm able to start doing weights. But let me tell you, when I was in the military, I was squatting and deadlifting 150, 150, 150 pounds. And I'm only 110. So for me, I'm like, whoa, this is so cool. I'm so cool. You know, and now to go from that to not being able to lift more than like 15 pounds, that that takes a lot on your your confidence in yourself. You're like, how do I go from that to this? But now I have a trainer that's helping me build up gradually build up and be safe about it. And that's the most important thing. So that's kind of how I went from homelessness to using my back injury and my love of cycling to raise awareness for homeless veterans. And I'm still continuing to do that. And so, you know, like I said, fitness is everything. It's it's all about balance. You have to be physically fit and mentally fit. And I think a lot of people don't think of that. They either do one or the other but you have to do both. You have to be mentally fit as well. And so like I do meditation, this is my meditation room. And actually I built that mirror behind me. I built furniture and stuff like that too. That painting over there, I did that painting. Um, And so those are some of the things I did to help stimulate me mentally. So I have my own little meditation room. I come in here, I have moments of peace and quiet, you know, for myself. Um, I'll journal and then I'll come in here and work out. And so it's so important for people to start setting boundaries and doing those things for themselves as well. And I don't think a lot of people do because they're always so busy. And it, it's really important. I'm curious, take me through a day when you were homeless. Like you went to work, you went to the gym. Did you like shower? No, no. no. So no, during that time, um, we had a gym in our building, but I think during that time it wasn't open. I think I was still trying to get access to it. Mm-hmm. So basically I would go to work, work, go and get in my car, go park nearby at a park, sleep, get back up, go to work and shower, not shower, but like wash up and stuff in the bathroom and get ready in the bathroom. That's dangerous too, right? I mean- Oh, it was very, because there's a lot of, there's a a large homeless population in DC and a lot of them aren't very mentally, you know, they have some mental health problems. And so, yeah, it was scary. Uh, You know, I really didn't get much sleep during that time because, you know, I was constantly waking up to see who was near my car, who was walking near it. And then I had my dog in there too. So he's waking up and barking at people that are coming near the car. So no, it's, it's not a very safe situation, but like I said, thankfully I had a friend who was able to take me in and let me stay with him for that month. And what, and this is the beautiful story in all of that. I went from homeless to owning my own home. Mm-hmm. I'd never owned a home in my life at 32 years old. I owned a home. And so not only was I able to go from being homeless to him helping me out to owning my own home, he ended up actually moving in with me and living with me for six months as well. As well. So wow. he helped me. I was able to help him. Now he has his own home. And so it's just beautiful how that came back full circle. You never realize when you help people, how that can not that I'm saying people should help people because they want to get something in return, but you just okay. never know. You can help someone and you never know how that'll come back to you later on. So it's 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 very beautiful that I had him to support me. But honestly, I didn't want to tell people. I'm a network news correspondent. I want to tell them I'm homeless. Like, come on, that's crazy. You know, and so it was embarrassing. It was scary. And honestly, it wasn't, I didn't make any bad decisions. That's the worst part because most people think, well, if you're homeless because you're a drug addict, you're yeah. doing something you ain't supposed to be. No, actually, I had moved here. I had three housing situations I'd set up. All three of them fell through when I got here. So Mm -hmm. that's how it happened. So I thought I was being prepared with having three, you know, scenarios if the others didn't work out and they didn't. And so that's kind of how that ended up happening. So I think that, too, is important to annotate and point out that not everyone that ends up homeless, it's because they did something wrong. I mean, think of it like this. How many people right now are homeless in Hawaii? Yeah. They woke up one night and their house is burning down. Yeah. They they could do nothing for that. So a lot of times people don't think of that, you know, how people end up in that situation. They just see them. Now, let me let me give you a funny story. I was doing a photo shoot in New York because I was putting out a portrait gallery to raise awareness about homeless veterans. And I dressed up as a homeless veteran and I sat outside in different places with a sign saying homeless veteran will work for food. Before I put the sign on, I was walking around. My clothes were kind of eh, but people were talking to me. Hey, how you doing? Ha, <laughs> you know, being nice and everything. The second I sat on the ground and put the sign up, those same people that I saw blocks away earlier 
walked past me and went like this and just like, like I didn't exist. One woman, her kid was there walking. She was like, isn't that the girl? She's like, Shh, shut up and shushed her and made her keep walking. Wow. And it was amazing. I wish I had video of it. It was amazing how nice those people were to me before. And then all of a sudden, when they saw me blocks later on the corner doing that, they instantly just ignored me like I didn't exist. Mm. I said, wow, that is so disheartening. I mean, I get it. You get some that aren't mentally stable. I understand that. But me, I will go talk to homeless people until they scare me. And then I'm like, okay, maybe I should back off. But I will go talk to them because at the end of the day, they're still humans. And at the end of the day, we don't know how they got in this situation. You know, we don't know at all. I talked to one woman. She um, became homeless. She had um, her husband. I believe it was her husband served in the military. He was the one working the entire time. She was a dependent. So she didn't work. And when he died, she had no way of getting a job because at that time she wasn't going to school. She had moved around so much. She didn't have, um, you know, any records of her, you know, what she had did over the last 10 or so years work wise. And she ended up losing the home and ended up homeless. Yeah. Those kind of stories people don't think about, you know, situations like that. She had been with him since she was 18 years old. And I think she was like 40. So she had been reliant on him her whole life. And then to go from that to, and she had no other family either. So she didn't have anyone else she could rely on. So just kind of raising awareness about those things. It's just so important, you know. Now, Rob, we both have Shiva Inus. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> well, I know that. You did. What color is your Shiba Inu? He's red. He's red? He's red. Yep. Seven have... year old. He's about 15 pounds and he's he's a little diva. That's why I said he's been in commercials. He's been on a runway. He's been on TV <laughs> sets. The next thing I'm trying to get him in some movies. So I'm like, that's my little diva dog. I love him to death. But yeah, his name's Crixus from the show Spartacus. And I saw yours. You have a white one, right? I have a white one and I'm divorced. I have a red one that he comes back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> and previous to that, I had a Shivinu for 13 years, a white. Oh, I so, love it. And he was in magazines, TV, <laughs> yeah, same. They same. Whole dog, yeah. Oh, that's see, I want to get a black one. I really want to get a black one, but the problem is, you know, as you know, they shed so much. Oh yeah. my gosh, they shed so much. And his fur is red. Imagine black. It's like tumbleweeds. I have four Roombas yeah. in my house that run all day and I still see tumbleweeds from him all the time. And I'm just like- You oh. have no idea. So when I first got the Shiba Inu, they're like, Is you do, do they shed? A little bit. It's like a cloud. <laughs> it's a cloud and <laughs> like a giant tumbleweed everywhere you go. <laughs> you wear black, you're wearing white fur everywhere you go, but they're so lovable that you just you forget. Do. I'm like, but you gotta turn everything in my house white. So that I won't see any of their fur, but they're the most loyal, they're the most loyal dogs ever. I've been sick for the last couple of days, and he hasn't left my side. But. Oh, oh, that's so sweet. They really are super loyal, and it's funny, funny story. They told me the same thing. I said, "Do they shed?" And they said, "No, they only shed like they only shed like once a year." Um, you mean they only not shed once a year because they he sheds every day. I don't know what they were talking about. Like that was a bold phase lie, but it's just. Oh, yeah. Funny. So I'll go out and, and, and brush him outside. And I kid you not, I should get videos of it. There's been times where the wind will blow and you'll get funnels, like mm -hmm. little tornadoes of his fur. And I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> like, it's crazy. I brought mine to the groomer and I went back and the, the woman who was grooming him was the first time she ever groomed a dog. She's like, she's shell shocked. She's like, there's enough hair, hair here for six dogs. <laughs> and she's like, and I can keep going. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> It's so true. I brush him once a week now, every Sunday. And it's usually two hours that I brush him. And the bag that I have or the little container I have is literally another dog. I was tempted oh, yeah. to take his fur and shape it into a dog and take a photo of it and say, this just came <laughs> off his body, literally. <laughs> so but, T, when you just mentioned shaping, I'm going to go back to the furniture building. You yeah. just said that like it was just something like, oh yeah, everybody builds furniture. So <laughs> how did you build learn to build furniture and do you actually have a workshop in your house or your garage? I do. Okay. So first and foremost, I'm native American. So I think I just naturally picked it up. I'm just, I don't know where it came from because basically I moved to Florida and I had no furniture before I moved to Florida. I worked for Fox news channel and they provided me my own vehicle. Like they bought me a brand new SUV and provided, you know, the money for the apartment and everything else. But I was on the road so much that all I had was a couch in my apartment. I didn't really need anything else because I was rarely ever home. 
So when I moved to Florida, I didn't have a car. I didn't have any furniture. I had a couch that ended up getting broken on the way of us transporting it to Florida. So I'm like, dang, I need some furniture. And I started looking at different companies. I'm not going to say what companies because I don't want to bash them, but I'm like, this is some crap. Like I'm not paying this money for this. Like it's cheap. Like I don't even know what the material was, but it just wasn't good quality stuff. And so I said, I'm going to build my own furniture. And everybody looked at me and was like, okay, Therese. And I'm like, no, really I am. As a matter of fact, the table I'm sitting on right now, I built this too. But um, so I started making furniture and people were like, whoa, she wasn't kidding. And they loved it so much. They started buying my stuff. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. I just picked it up. I started watching a couple of YouTube videos and I'm like, I like this. I got into epoxy. I built my, the first table I ever built set, it can seat 10 people. And it's got a, a river going through it with rocks and moss and all that. And I built it specifically because like I said, I'm Native American and I wanted to feel like I had a river flowing through my kitchen. So that was the first table I ever built. And people didn't believe me when I said I built that. They were like, there's no way you had help. No, I'm like, no, I really, I really didn't. And then I built another table that I ended up selling for like $12,000 um, that I made. And this woman, she was in her 50s. She had been collecting shells her whole life. So she had this massive bag of shells. And she said, I really want a table that represents all the shells I collected. She's in Florida. So I built this table made out of acacia wood. I think it was like 250 pounds. And I put all these shells throughout the, throughout the table with ocean waves and everything. And she, to this day, she just messaged me on Instagram last week saying, it was like a week or two ago saying, I love my table. I still love it. It still looks great. And so that's kind of how I got into building furniture. So like I mentioned earlier, over here, this mirror here, I actually built uh, built from Miami Dade wood, and I think it's oh, it's over 150 years old because the wood came from the housing when they first initially settled in Florida. Um, that's from the the planks from the housing. Um, once they started tearing those house those houses down, we went and got some of the wood from it. So I built that mirror. I've built dining room tables. I've built coffee tables. I make serving trays. I even took a serving tray to the Maldives and did some shot some commercials of people using it and interacting with it. And it has sand and shells in it, you know, and it looks like a beach. So I say, hey, if you can't bring, if you can't go to the Maldives, bring the Maldives to you. So I'm about to start a new line of serving trays with sand and shells from the Maldives. Um, hoping to start that in December or January. So yeah. Kinda. And so do you have a website with all you, with your woodworks on it or the furniture you built? Or maybe have you thought about creating a website so that people can see what you can do uh, I had a website and then during the pandemic, things got crazy. So I kind of yeah. shut it down. So right now I have an Instagram account that people can check out and they can go see everything on it. I'm hoping once my book comes out and things kind of settle down, then I'll be able to either add that as an extra page on the website for my book, or I can create a whole separate website for it as well. But as of right now, I just have it on my my Instagram, which is live, live edge artistry. And it should be live underscore edge underscore artistry which I can, I can send that to you guys, but yeah. So it's, 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 it's pretty interesting. I actually wish I was downstairs because all my front, almost all my furniture in my house I built. <laughs> so you'd be able to see like a lot of the stuff that I've done, but I can send some video to you guys you later create, on. You should create a bubble of some sort to put around the Shiba Inu so the hair doesn't get off. Like, so <laughs> I'm going to send you a video I made. I actually made a dog house and I made a video it's called. Of course Pink. you did. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I do a lot of stuff. I made this dog house out of a dresser. And then I made this whole video where it was pimped out. So it's got a sunroof. It sings to Alexa. It's got lights in it. It's got photos of him on the back wall. It's got like, yeah, like it's got paneling on it and everything. And so that's actually in the other room over here. I used to have him in that, but he's gotten too big for it now. But yeah, no, I had that. And I, <laughs> It was able to keep some of the fur in wow. there, you know? But like, yeah, and then I made this whole really cool, I called it Garnier Television's Pimp, Pimp My Dog Crib. Or it was like Dog Cribs, that's what it was, Dog Cribs. Good. And it was a spoof off of Pimp My Ride and dog, um, the other show on MTV, Cribs. So mm -hmm. I kind of combined the two and then made like a little cute little music video of it afterwards. And I'll send that to you guys. It's real cute and funny, but yeah. That, that's what I did. So my little bougie dog got his own little Alexa system in his own little dog house to keep all the fur in there. And um, <laughs> yeah, so I know it's random, but it's great. <laughs> right. And with all this going on, how are you getting ready for your, your world competition? Because I also think, don't you have some possibilities of being an intern at a special house there on Pennsylvania Avenue? 
Yes. So it's been a lot. Um, one thing I will say, I've been very good at, I think the military has been great at teaching me how to com compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. So I make sure I make time for certain things every day. Um, you know, whether it's practicing for the pageant, whether it's, you know, write, writing my book, whether it's sending emails out to raise you know, awareness for something. Um, I've been very great at compartmentalizing. And yes, it's been very interesting because as you know, I'm going to a lot of different events as well. Um, so juggling that, doing runway shows, doing photo shoots, while also promoting the jewelry that I'm now a spokesperson for, also promoting my own products while also promoting the pageant. It's a lot, um, but I enjoy it. As you can tell, I'm very high energy and um, I love staying busy. So for me, I like the challenge of it. And so, you know, I make sure I dedicate certain thing times during the day to do certain things. And yes, I could potentially be working at the big house. <laughs> uh -huh. we'll see. I'm hoping we'll see. Um, we'll find out in October if I'm able to get that position. But if not, I'm also uh, interviewing for a network as well. So we'll kind of see where that goes. And uh, we'll see how I'm able to juggle everything once either of those come into place, but I think I've been pretty good at it so far, so. When is the competition? It's October 20th through the 22nd, and it's in Port St. Lucie, Florida. So mm -hmm. really excited, get to go to Florida. You know, when it's cold up here, it'll be nice and warm there. And it's it's uh, two, well, I'll get there the 19th. So it's like two or three days, and you know, they do the interviews, they do the training. A lot of times they'll have a big dinner. They'll have a party afterwards after you've done everything to celebrate. And then they'll have the day that they showcase everything, which is where most people see on TV. They go, they walk, they answer the questions, and then they reveal who the winner is. So I'm really excited. It's gonna be, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a great experience. And the pageant I'm in, Miss International World, they're just phenomenal. When I say they are so about empowering women, like mm -hmm. it's beautiful and like everyone's kind to each other everyone helps each other I've done pageants before mm -hmm. and, you know didn't have that experience and with them it's been mm -hmm. amazing the support and you know it's genuine it's not they're not doing mm -hmm. it for any other reason other than they want to see you succeed which is such a, a breath of fresh air because most people when they help other people it's because they want to get something out of it but they're, you know, the women in the, in the pageant and the, the women that are running it aren't like that at all. They they just want to see you succeed and, and see you live your best life. And I love it. So for uh, women who are watching this, if you want to check it out, it's Miss International World. It's an amazing competition. If you want to be a part of something that's supportive, empowering, and, you know, it's great exposure. Uh, I think you should definitely check it out. So I, I love it and I'm excited. So hopefully you guys will be able to check it out. Also, for those that can't attend uh, in person, there's a virtual option as well. So people can get virtual tickets to, to check it out as well. Will you be ready? Will you win? Do you want to make it clear? <laughs> wait, wait, I'm sorry, say that again? Will you be ready? Will you win? Do you want to make that statement? Oh, well, I'm, I'm already ready. I'm ready. I'm always ready. I stay, You're ready a winner. I stay ready, you know? <laughs> but, but you know, yeah. the most but the most important thing for me is even if I don't, the whole point of me going into this is because I wanted to build my network. I, I, I like to joke and say, I'm trying to build my tribe of warrior women. And honestly, that's why I'm getting into this. I want to build that network. I wanna mm -hmm. help other women support their dreams while we're all helping each other support our dreams. So at the end of the day, I'm our, I've already won. I've already won because I've met so many phenomenal women already who've helped me and I'm helping them. So. I've already won. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, you know, so it all depends on what yeah. you're going into it for. That's yeah. my reason. I'm going into it for the, the meeting other women and just the experience. And Therese, as a journalist, do you have a, um, a person who is your inspiration, the template, the person that you look to to say, eventually, I want to be my version of that person? Or yeah. um, I, I'm trying to model myself after that person. It's so funny you bring that up. And I'm, I'm actually getting teary eyed that you just brought that up. So I recently found a video that I made back in 2012 where my idol, I made a video to my idol when I was in Japan asking her to mentor me and that my idol is Oprah Winfrey. And I made this video <laughs> back when I was a little baby airman uh, in Japan. And I said, hey, you know, I want to be a network news correspondent. Will you be my mentor and take me under your wing? posted the video up, it went viral. She never saw the video. But the moral of that story is CNN saw the video 
And then CNN called me up and was like, hey, we want you to come to Atlanta and check out our bureau. And I went to CNN and I met a bunch of phenomenal people. That was back in 2012. 10 years later, I ended up being a Pentagon correspondent. So for me, just seeing that video, how one, how far I've come. And then two, I remember when I made that video, everyone was making fun of me. They're like, you're weird. Why are you making that video? No one's going to see it. Like you're doing too much. You're so extra and making fun of me about it. And then for me to put that video up and then literally 10 years later, see that I wasn't going to let people deter me for what my dreams were. I didn't care if people thought it was weird. I didn't care if they thought it, I was, you know, it wasn't going to go anywhere. I was going to try it. And if it didn't go anywhere, okay, it didn't. But look where it went. CNN called me up, you know, flew me to Atlanta. I got to tour it. And then that literally set the domino effect of where I ended up being, you know, a Pentagon correspondent, a national correspondent 10 years later. And so what was so beautiful about finding that is, and I posted this, uh, I made a post about it. I said, look, the moral of this whole story is follow your dreams. What did, I think it was Michael Jordan that said, you miss every shot you don't take. Take the shot. All you can do is miss and then try again. And with me doing that, I was able to get to where I had hoped I would get to. And everyone can do it. They just have to believe in themselves and they have to ignore all the, da, 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 ignore all that and just know this is my goal and this is what I want to do and believe it. Believe you already, you're already doing it. Believe you already have it and it's going to happen and it's going to come. So I'm hoping with me sharing that post, a lot of people were like, wow, that's amazing. I don't want the focus to be on me. The focus is on, you can do it too. That's the point of the video. You can do it too. And so I hope that's what people take from it when they see that. But yes, Oprah Winfrey is my idol. You know, she was a radio show host. She had her own show. Her whole life has been spent giving back to people. She was abused. You know, she talked about her struggles um, being raped. And, and so for me, I felt like literally I was basically living the same life that she had. You know, and so that's why I looked up to her so much because, wow, that's so beautiful. She literally overcame all of that. And look where she is now. Look where she is. Look at all the people, all the people that she's helping now. She did not let that incident or those incidents define her or, you know, or make any decisions on what she's going to do in her life. And that's how I've mimicked, modeled my life. And that's why I hope that that'll come off to other people that they, they can do the same thing. I'm getting teary-eyed. <laughs> so powerful, though, because why not you? Like you said, why not? You know, you have to dream big. And if people like Musk and um, Bill Gates and Zuckerberg, if they didn't have these huge dreams, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be in some of the positions we're in now. Some of the, the great social media content or uh, experiences that we have or access to social media where we can connect the world through a click here and a mouse strike there. So I think keep dreaming big, you know, like we say in the Air Force, aim high. Yeah. Um, because it's possible. You know, like uh, you know, I probably think for you, Frank, who would have ever thought you would be leading this content, media content with muscle and fitness that has 18 million people basically follow the content you put up. Yeah. And so Just, many, uh, why so many, not? So many people looking at you and your story right now, and you're inspiring so many people. And it's just Nothing feels better than when people come up to you and say, you changed my life or you've really inspired me to do this or better myself. There's no, there's no better gift in the world, monetary, whatever. When people come up to you and say, you changed my life, you inspired me to do, go after my dreams and do it. There's nothing better than that. So it's beautiful. Just know that, just know that your book is going to touch the lives of so many people that, that you won't even know but you're going to make a difference. And that's the most important thing is to, so many people are causing disruption and stuff and not healing. There's not enough healing going on in this world and you are going to heal so many people with this book. So you should, I, I don't have to tell you, you should be so proud of yourself for, for, you know, creating this, this, this book, which is more than a book. It's a, uh, an inspiration to people. Thank you. Thank and you. Maybe a, a how-to guide for people to get through it because sometimes they don't know what they don't know, but you laying some things out, they might say, this doesn't affect or it doesn't work for me directly, but now it gives me a, a start, a foundation of work to build out my, my ways to find help for myself. And, you know, through fitness, I have seen it firsthand. Frank and I had known, uh, known the founders, the bodybuilding movement, Joe and Ben Weeder and Betty Weeder. 
And fortunately for me, I had a chance to be with them often. And we would walk through expo halls and uh, Mr. Olympia and other bodybuilding competitions. And people would come to them with tears in their eyes and sometimes shaking, saying, you don't know what you did by changing my life, by providing this information about bodybuilding, by providing these magazines and people finding their tribe through bodybuilding, you mm -hmm. know, where they might have been wearing these outlanders pants and big shirts and drinking protein <laughs> shake and wearing yeah. these kind of uh, loud sneakers. Well, now there's a tribe of people who understand you mm -hmm. and also support you. So yes. I, I think you're going to do just, you know, big, big things. And eventually you're going to be calling us and saying, Oprah called me. Oh, she wants, <laughs> no, I would she die. wants me to be on her show. <laughs> I would literally die. I'd be like, oh my gosh, I would, that would be phenomenal. I mean, cause like you just said, mm -hmm. like I'm getting teary eyed just talking about her because I'm like, I understand. I mean, I understand to a certain extent what she went through and what she overcame, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and the impact that she's having. And that's my, that's my only goal. I just want to help as many people as I can, you know, whether I know mm -hmm. if it helped them or not, you know, the, the hope is when I die that I left this planet better than when I entered it. That's that's the right. hope and the goal. And so, yeah, I, I hope so. But I mean, you guys too, come on, take some credit now. You guys are literally living examples of facing, you know, pursuing your dreams and this is where you are now. So you guys are also inspirations to others on, hey, look, this is what you can do to get where we are. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's beautiful when you meet other people who also followed their dreams, didn't listen to the naysayers, and then you see where they come up on top. You know, and so it's an inspiration to be able to talk to you guys, know you both and, you know, develop this friendship because it's so important to also develop friendships with others who are like minded as well, because now you all are going to promote each other and push each other to be better, mm -hmm. you know, and help each other grow. And that's what's so important, having that support system, which goes back full circle. As a kid, I never felt I had, but now I feel like I'm definitely having so much support come from people I don't even know, you know, and it's just like, wow, this is, this is a beautiful thing. So, you know. <laughs> yep. And it didn't start off that way, T. Think no. about how uh, you and I first met. Shh. Stop talking. <laughs> <so much. laughs> you got to share that story. It's so Go funny. ahead, T. Tell them the story. Okay. So I was invited to go to an event at Howard University. It was celebrating the integration of Blacks into the military. And I was invited mm -hmm. because one, I'm Four, four generations of military that served. So I had my great grandfather served in World War II. Then I had my grandfather who served in Vietnam. Then I had my dad that served in Desert Storm. And then I served. And I'm also the only woman to serve. Mind you, we're all Native American and Black. So they're like, this is perfect. This is about you. You're what they're celebrating. So I show up with my little crown and sash on and I go in and I sit down and, and, and a gentleman, I'm not going to say his name, but a gentleman comes over and he's like, hey, my name is this and you're a queen and we need to take a photo together because this is fitting, you know? And I said, okay, cool. I didn't really know who he was at the time. So I said, okay, cool. So we took a photo. I sat in the far back, mind you, because I had this big old crown on and I'm like, I'm going to sit in the back because I don't want people to have to look through this crown and be irritated. So I'll just, and he's like, no, come sit up in the front next to me. And I'm like, okay, sure. So me and my friends move up and sit next to him. And so throughout the the uh, <laughs> throughout the the uh, speech, you know, we we're chatting, you know, chatting a little bit, and you know, mm. he he likes to talk, and and you know, I like to respond, and so <laughs> <laughs> so we're sitting there chatting, and Rob's sitting in front of us, and and I know people around us were getting irritated, not you know, and I'm also trying to listen as well, you know, but I don't know this gentleman, and I'm like, you know, it's, yeah, hopefully we're not irritating people too much. So anyways, Rob turns around, he goes, shh. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, and so afterwards, you know, come to find out that the, the gentleman's in the army. I found out Rob was in the Air Force. And I'm like, Rob, man, you know, it's these army people, man. You can't trust them with anything. I mean, they're troublemakers. It wasn't me at all. Like Air Force, we're innocent, you know, and he just kind of laughed. And that's kind of how we ended up becoming friends. After that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's pretty funny. Yes, that is pretty funny. But you never know. You run into people and... Um... Great things will happen. So, um, Frank, do you have any more questions before we let her uh, T go? She, she's got a full day. She's got to go build a cabinet and go do a, a photo <laughs> shoot before it's dark. So we yeah. better let her go soon. Well, obviously, want to say thank you for joining us. But talk about the book, uh, the title, where to get it, when it's coming out. One more time, so people Excellent. are aware. 
Absolutely. Thank you. So the book's called No Longer Silent. I'll be launching the website on October 1st. That's when the pre-sales will start. Um, so I'll let you guys know what the website is and I can send over the links, but it's No Longer Silent. The official launch date will be on Veterans Day 11-11, um, which will be the 10-year anniversary of me surviving being assaulted. So hoping that a lot of people will read the book and understand that you know, this is happening to a lot of people. There's so many service members who have come up to me after hearing that I was doing this, telling me their story and how, you know, the reaction and what they had to go through. And so I'm really hoping that people will check it out, even if they haven't been assaulted. You know, this is great for if you have children, because you don't know what's happening. You can't be around your child 24 seven, you know, or if you have a friend that you think it may have happened, it'll explain to you what you should and what you should not do. So I'm hoping everyone will get a chance to check it out. The official launch will be on Veterans Day and the pre-launch will be on October 1st. Awesome. Robert, last words. <laughs> well, again, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. We look forward to following you again. We were a little bit intimidated because we've never had a trained journalist on our show before. So you how'd know, I do? I, how'd I do? We try to, we try to have a good time. Wasn't about you, it was about us. <laughs> we were like concerned. We'd be like, why did I get on with these knuckleheads? But you know, we really, really appreciate you um helping raise our game. And we'll be coming back to you for advice on how we can be better at what we do. Because uh, like you, we want to reach and help other people with the platforms that we've been provided. And um especially with the coming election. You know, I think next year is going to be a very pivotal year in our in our country. And we need to use whatever tools we have to unify the country, bring people together, as opposed to being at each other's throats, because we've had enough of that for a long enough time. So thank you for being an advocate for fitness, for women, for sexual abuse and trauma victims, for homeless veterans. You've done it all for probably eventually opening up your own cabinet shop there and being an <laughs> artist. <laughs> What can't you do, I guess, is what is the bottom line. And the only thing that you won't be doing is taking over our podcast. That's for sure, sister. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, thank you guys for having me. I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so honored. And like I said, you know, just knowing you both and what you're doing as well, any help you need as far as like broadcasting that I love doing that. So if you guys ever want any advice or any help in that sense, please let me know. I would love to help any way I can help get your messages out as well. Um, and, you know, it's just an honor. And you're right. It, it, well, we've been, you. been dealing with a lot of turmoil over these last few years. So we we need to start changing some things so that we all start bonding together, especially with mm -hmm. everything that's going on. We have to stick together. So anything I can do to help, please let me know. Um, I would love to, to be able to do that. And yes, let's keep in touch, please. Appreciate yes. it. Good luck in the competition. Thank you. Yes, Thank good you luck. So Actually, yes. we'll have you back on so you can give us a little pre, uh, you can tell us how it went. Okay. And um, well, actually just tell us how you beat everybody. Just to, just all we need to know. <laughs> We're going to project you winning. That's how it's going to be. Speak it into it. existence. Speak it into existence. That's I love right. it. Yes. We're manifesting. Why that. not you? <laughs> That's right. Well, again, thanks, Frank. Thanks for Thank doing you. this too. As I know you haven't been feeling well for the last few days. So we really appreciate you sticking it out. And uh, T, we'll be in touch pretty soon. Sounds good. Um, good luck with everything. Everyone be safe out there. Have a great weekend. And we'll be back online next week with another guest. Take care, everyone. Thank you.